This is the third week and final week of the course on spirit, science and consciousness and Amit Faswami is our speaker tonight. Amit is a theoretical nuclear physicist. The first theoretical nuclear physicist I've uh, had the pleasure to get to know really well. <laughs> and um, he's Professor Emeritus from the University of um, Oregon. And some of you may know Amit if you saw the film back uh, in 2004, What the Bleep. Uh, he was a contributor to um, that particular film, but he's also well known for his <coughs> writing. And um, I've got one of his books here that we've had um, in our library, which is uh, God is Not Dead. And uh, he's well known for taking um, the subject of quantum physics and um, providing kind of a human and a, an accessible uh, message around uh, our, using our intuition and uh, creativity. Tonight's talk is called The Science of Quantum Consciousness, a.k.a. God. So, Amit, <laughs> over to you. Thank you, Kili. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. I, um, I don't mind standing up um, and giving the talk. That, is, that has been my practice all this. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll just do that. Why not? <clears throat> These days I sit down more because I, I, I have um, been reminded by my wife repeatedly that don't overexert yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. So I'm delighted that you came to dwell some time on this very um, important, although uh, some people think it's a very elevated subject, very esoteric, and the same people, of course, um, usually deny that there can be ever a science of God, because God is sacred, very elevated, and science talks about very practical stuff. So, you know, and also don't forget that, um, at least in the West, uh, Christianity is very popular and Jesus is the guru of Christianity and Jesus clearly said let the affairs of Caesar be the affairs of Caesar and let us take care of our affairs, namely the sacred. So should we listen to a question of integration of the two? I submit that if we don't listen to possibilities of integration, the whole human civilization is in deep trouble, jeopardy. Everywhere in the world, in every culture, every society, I have been fortunate to um, be born in India and then live in the United States, so I know two cultures very intimately. And amazingly, in both cultures, the uh, polarization is very, very deep. I come to England almost every year. I have seen plenty of polarization here as well. The polarization is so severe now that one group of people, the religious group, they uh, do not even believe the elementary, rudimentary scientific facts like evolution. And um, the other group, the, um, you can call them atheists, but really they are, um, I'll, I call them by a little more sophisticated term, scientific materialists. You know, materialists, that only means that you value pleasure. But uh, scientific materialists are a little more sophisticated than that. They are the people who believe that matter is everything. And because matter is everything, then for the human level, brain is everything. And brain has only pleasure centers, it turns out. Brain does not really have any center of what we truly call happiness. Brain does not have any center that can be called love, or love in the sense that we understand uh, if we like the idea of God. Then there is spiritual love, which in Christianity is called agape. Brain just doesn't have anything to do with these things. Brain knows pleasure. So if you are a believer in brain, you undermine love 
If you are a believer in brain, you don't believe in truth. If you are a believer in brain, you don't believe in justice, you don't believe in goodness, you don't believe in ethics. So what happens is that you become very wishy-washy about values. So one side does not believe in evolution and the other side does not believe in any values. Imagine the situation. So when you elect one side or the other in the political process that we covet, that we have developed with literally human blood in the 18th century, is now in utter disarray because whoever we elect is going to just do a very one-sided trick on us and nothing solves our problems which requires both values and evolution, both science and spirituality. What to do? This is the dilemma. So are we doomed? Are we completely doomed? This is going to be the state of affairs. If you lived in America, you would believe that we are doomed. <coughs> Polarization is so deep and it's actually 50-50. It all depends on the mood of the public at that particular moment if the one half is going to elect a president or the other half. Completely matter of chance. Situation probably is not that bad in England, but it's going to be because this polarization is very deep until we really resolve the question of integration of science and spirituality. We are going to be saddled with these two worldviews, diametrically opposite, cannot meet together. Now you remember Rudyard Kipling wrote a long time ago about East is East, West is West, the twins shall never meet. This is in the West, this is also in the East, everywhere. Materialist and spiritualist, the twin shall never meet. This is real. Kipling himself knew that what he's talking about is not real because the next two lines says that they will meet, right? But here, a very minority of us scientists fortunately see that yes, integration is inevitable. We have heard the message of quantum physics, this new science that's come around. So that's what I want to share with you. And a few people on the religion side likewise have seen the value of integration. Dalai Lama is one of them. That's good news. But most importantly, how do you feel? And here is my reason to be very optimistic. I think you will feel good about the new news about quantum physics and its message. So look at it, look at it this way. As if you live this evening, even with the question that it is a relevant question. Is it possible to understand God scientifically? Even if you just admit that, yes, it's a good question, I think I will have served my purpose and I'll be very happy. So let's begin in the beginning. What is it that we think in the question of God that prevents it from scientifically treated? Well, one of the questions people often say is that there is no one opinion about God among the world's religions. But isn't there? Yes, ex agreed that religions quibble a lot about the nature of God. I'm sure if, we, if I did the classroom trick, I do that very often. I let the students take over and let them talk about it for a while. Um, if I did that here, I'm sure that you would also differ about what God is. Nobody can say one thing or another that another person will be sure to agree. But it turns out, in spite of all this superficial disagreement, there is agreement on one score. And it is this. Spiritual people, religious people believe that all the causality of the universe cannot be explained on the basis of material interactions alone. 
scientific materialism holds that matter is everything and material interactions determine everything. Today, the situation is kind of uh, lopsided in our educational system because even before the religious people knew about it, we somehow, uh, scientific materialists somehow um, corrupted the school boards enough to introduce this dictum, this dogma, even in books that elementary school students read. And that is that everything in the world is made up of elementary particles. But that is just very unfortunate. We really don't know is the right answer. In fact, with quantum physics, if you um, listen to even the rudimentary quantum physics and truly uh, comprehend it, which I hope you will after tonight, then you realize that this scientific materialism obviously is the wrong philosophy anyhow. So everything is not made up of atoms. So religious people from the get-go realize that that everything couldn't possibly be made up of atoms because they intuit that there are some phenomena for which material causes just cannot be given. So um, the materialist model of the universe, let me give you a sort of show you the picture. The picture is, you'll have to forgive me for doing this repeatedly because the, the, uh, the slides have everything in it, and I'm giving a five-day course here, so there are just too many things that we will not explain. But this one is fundamental. This is called the um, scientific materialist picture of the world. This is what is basically taught. I'm ashamed to admit that somehow the school boards have cooperated with this blasphemy uh, in religious terms, that everything is made up of atoms and elementary particles. So the idea is that atoms make molecules, make molecules, uh, make atoms, sorry, elementary particles make atoms, make molecules, make cells, make the brain, and then brain makes consciousness. All the subjective experiences of God, spirituality, love, all the values that you covet, everything comes from the brain. This is called upward causation model. Spiritual people insist that no, on the top of this upward causation, nobody can deny material causation. They are real, of course. But there is also downward causation. And I give you a nice picture too. Downward causation. Let there be light and there is light. Only with that light if you start seeing, then the world becomes a dazzling, enchanted place to you. If you live without this light, divine light, then you are just a machine and your life is very drab and that's the fate of the uh, materialist and atheist and we feel sorry for you. <laughs> but of course materialists come back and say that, but we have the pleasure centers in the brain. And you deny yourself pleasure. So who is feel sorry for whom? <laughs> Goes on and on and on. But really, this is a scientific question. This is the thing that we have not understood before. We used to think that philosophy, and God certainly is a philosophical idea, no question about it, no denying it. Any idea that cannot be verified directly, you know, people used to say, uh, uh, naughty students, used to uh, ask their spiritual teachers, clergymen, okay, show me God, then I'll believe it, right? Now, of course, I cannot show you God. So the student goes away uh, very dissatisfied and in a way triumphant. I have defeated the clergy in direct argument. Showing is believing, otherwise why should I believe it? So, uh, People used to believe that philosophical ideas are those ideas that cannot be proven. They are not scientific. As recently as the uh, middle of 20th century, 
Richard Feynman has exactly said that about all kinds of things, even including the concept of the unconscious, because how do you prove it? Show me. Anything that cannot be seen, unconscious by definition, cannot be seen, so how can you prove it? But thank God, in the meantime, in the last 60 years, a tremendous change has taken place in science. The show me challenge is not working anymore. We can show you. So tonight I'll show you God. Not only I'll theorize about God in a very convincing way, but I'll show you God. Literally, I mean it. So philosophy can be verified. We call it experimental metaphysics. And this experimental metaphysics is changing the shape of the world, changing the paradigm of science, and we have a scope of really reshaping, rebuilding our civilization. It's still a long way, because the forces of establishment is very entrenched. So don't underestimate the power of inertia. But still, I think as more and more of us recognize the huge opportunity that this new quantum science is opening before us, we can get empowered. We can get empowered enough to believe that we can change our society in drastical ways. In drastic ways so that science and spirituality will not only be integrated, but we can reset our society to not only value material pleasures and stuff, but also value once more, once again, love and happiness. Okay, enough preamble. So now let me, let's go into some substance. <clears throat> Why is this picture wrong? I said outright. Very few things can be, can be said to be so outright. But this is one of the things that can be said outright, that this is just wrong. Why? Quantum physics says objects are not what we thought until quantum physics came along. How do, do we, how do we picture objects? Now, Mr. Newton did it very long ago. Very long ago, you all are supposed to know about this, but probably have forgotten a little <laughs> bit of it. So I'll give a quick refresher. Things, objects, are things because their behavior, said Mr. Newton, can be predicted. He called them Newton's, we call them Newton's laws. He never gave his, gave his own name on the laws. But he said there are laws of motion. And if you then know a little bit about the objects by measuring some initial conditions, like their position and velocity, and then Take my laws, and my laws will tell you everything there is to know about these objects. This is why they are things. We know how, to, how they move, what their future is, and therefore we can control them. So we have this very controlled view, controllable view of nature. And of course, that has given us many, many successful technologies. And in the process, we slowly have started to believe that indeed everything is mechanical. Or if we don't explicitly believe that, we um, become very confused people, where we feel that we have to deny science anyway, because otherwise we have to give up our coveted values, religions, etc because this science literally has now expanded so far as to say that this is everything there is. In other words, science has given us so much successful technology that scientific materialism has become a very successful dogma. It really has become a great threat. So you don't have much choice. Either you believe this or you believe that, because then you have to really deny this. So what to do? 
or quantum physics came along and it said atoms are not things, elementary particles are not things in that Newtonian sense. What are they? Radical concept, radical concept. Objects are possibilities. What does that mean? A Newtonian object is a definite thing in terms of position, velocity, these quantities can be completely stated. Well, the electron is here and it's moving with that speed. What that enables you to do is to determine the trajectory of electrons' movement forever and ever. And since everything is made of these electrons and other elementary particles called quarks, so everything is determined. But if it is possibility, if the objects are possibilities, then immediately we can ask, well, whose possibility? Something immediately starts bothering us. If it is possibilities, then is it possible that we choose among these possibilities and really it's not so determined after all? Maybe our choice has something to do with what these possibilities eventually become when they become actualities. Maybe it is not controllable. Maybe it's not determined like the Newtonian scientists are saying. If it is not, then there is scope for downward causation. Now, of course, some of you may think <clears throat> this is not so good because God, what is God? If there is downward causation from the God outside of us, aren't we jumping uh, from a rock into a hard place? Because that also is not us. God is separate from us, right? The answers that emerge from quantum physics is, is astounding. Astounding because it, it's, it's not like this, but it's not like that either. So you don't have to worry, those of you who are afraid that we are going back to the dark ages because religion will dominate society once again. No, don't, don't be hasty. This is a new kind of stuff that the new science is discovering. It's really quite new. The spiritual tradition, new science is saying the spiritual tradition said something right. It's a good question. Is there downward causation? And it, the answers will be affirmative, true. But it's not the old answers that gave us very moribund societies and we have been read of and, and, and it's better that way. It's not going to be like the olden days either. Truly possibility of a new age. So let's see how that, how that happens. Let's try to shape this thing with the language of quantum physics, this very picture. So you have possible elementary particles. Listen to the language carefully. Possible elementary particles making possible atoms, making possible molecules, making possible cells, making possible brain, making possible consciousness. And then the big question for the physicist is, how does this possibility, how do the possibilities become actual events? Because whenever we look at them, this is the, this is the part where it becomes really, really very intriguing. Because when we look at them, like this chair, it is a com combination of elementary particles, nobody doubts that. But we are not seeing this chair as possible chairs in many different possible places. We are not seeing an actual chair where the center of mass is located in actual place. No doubt about it, right? <coughs> Whenever I look, I find them in, as in the form of an actuality. I never see possibilities. So the question of science is, very relevant question, very challenging question, that what is in our looking that makes possibility into actuality. Because according to this model, all we have is a possible consciousness. So the observer is also a possible being. So how can a possible being, a possible Amit, looking at a possible chair, makes an actual chair, an actual Amit? How can that be, how can that be possible? 
This is a paradox. This is a paradox. Right? Paradoxes are very definite proof that the underlying logic is wrong. Whenever there is a paradox, means that your underlying assumptions have some basic flaw in it. So the paradoxes, people tried to go around the paradox in a variety of ways, but there was a mathematician named John Fuhr Newman. He proved with mathematics, very solid mathematics, nobody has been able to refute it ever since, that within quantum physics, there is no way, no mathematics, that you can bring to make possibility into actuality if we use material interactions alone. Material interactions can never convert possibility into actuality. Of course, common sense tells us the same thing. If possibility could make actuality, then we could all look for possible money and then we could buy all of our possible houses and possible cars and possible luxuries and we could get actual cars when we wake up. But no, we never wake up from such a dream. If we wake up, we don't find any of the actualities that we're hoping for. So mathematics and common sense are telling us the same thing. Possibility coupled to possibility can never give you actuality. What can give you actuality? This became a dominant question of physics for almost 60 years before it was finally solved with a radical idea. The solution comes in the nature of observer. We have been assuming that the observer is brain, made up of elementary particles. Then brain is possibility and consciousness has to become possibility. Does not work? The other camp, the religious camp, always assumes that downward causation exists, of course, but that comes from a God that is outside of us, right? A God separate from the world. This is called dualism. Then the question is, how, is that, how does this non-material God interact with matter to exert downward causation on matter? You think about it, can something which has nothing in common with something else, can they interact? Anybody who has had an interaction with a person of the opposite sex knows that even so hard to interact, even men and women cannot really inter interact in a very peaceful way. And they are made of the same atoms and molecules, at least but they are not made of the same upbringing. That's what, not, not of the same, exactly same anatomy and, uh, and, and not in the same way that their mind and emotions have been brought up and made. So even those differences cause communication such a difficulty. So how can you even fathom that a non-material can interact with material? More than that, scientists have shown that the energy of the material universe alone is constant. Scientists also have shown that any interaction between people and things or between two things require an exchange of energy in the form of signal. A signal going from you to the other is what enables us to communicate. We know that. We speak and speaking is a propagation of signals, right? So, dualism is not scientifically tenable. I mean, you can hold on to a dualistic God, but it's not going to be science. Again, back to the same conundrum. Is there a third way of looking at things? <coughs> this is the crucial question. It took us 60 years, but Eventually, an answer came about, which is very easy as soon as I have spoken it, but of course it takes time to grasp it because it's a radical way of thinking about <laughs> consciousness, about God. But 
it is really a third alternative. Suppose consciousness is the ground of being. That's a complex way of saying that everything is made of consciousness. Suppose instead of saying that brain makes consciousness, we just turn it upside down. Consciousness makes brain. I have a pin here which says consciousness does matter. So usually we have posited that matter does consciousness routinely and many of us accept it. So consider for a moment that consciousness does matter. That is the truth. So what does that mean? That means material possibilities are possibilities of consciousness. They are not outside of consciousness. So there is no dualism here. When we say consciousness chooses actuality out of possibility, we are saying that consciousness is choosing from itself. And therefore no signal is required. See what I mean? I'll give you a little bit of illustration of this that will make it a little simpler to understand. Oops. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing, right. <clears throat> I, I, I do have a picture, please be patient. <laughs> Sorry about this. You have to go through all of this. Now this is a clue to what I just said. This is a very interesting picture. It's really a picture which has two meanings. And if you, look, if you keep at it, you will see both meanings eventually. The one is an old woman, but the same lines also convey the picture of a young woman. The artist called this picture my wife and my mother-in-law. So can you see both? Yeah, if you just shift your perspective a little bit by shifting your head, you'll, you'll get. But are you doing anything to the picture? Are you doing anything to the picture? If we do, then of course it's very easy to see. That is true, agreed. But you don't need to do anything to the picture to see that there are two pictures in it. Why? Because both meanings are actually in our mind. Both meanings are already within us. There is no inherent meaning in these lines. We give the meaning by looking at the lines in this way or that way. This is true of any picture. We create the meaning. Because the meanings are already within us, we can choose. We can choose just by shifting our perspective of looking. So it is in this way, matter exists in consciousness as possibility. How consciousness looks depending on that particular perspective in that particular measurement, the electron appears here or the electrons appears over there or over there or over there. So we say electron is a wave of possibility having many possible positions at the same time. In a particular experiment, we just choose that one possibility. The question immediately comes, this chair, is it really a wave of possibility? I look and I find it here. I close my eyes, I look, lo and behold, it's still there, same place. Not true. Scientists have some doubt for a while. For a while, many people maintain some doubt. Maybe quantum physics doesn't hold for macroscopic objects. But then laser instruments came along and they can measure distance so accurately that finally we have been able to measure that even during the period I'm closing my eyes and then looking back, even during that period, the center of mass of the chair shifts by some 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. And these laser instruments can measure such puny distances and tell us that it is indeed so. Quantum physics is correct, um, Mr. Newton. Bless his soul, is wrong. And you have to handle it. What does that mean? That means that there really is quantum physics which governs 
all objects of the world, micro and macro. There is no way of hiding behind the fact that, well, quantum weirdness exists only in the micro world and we don't have to worry about it. No, it's not just the electrons which are possibilities that we choose from to, man to manifest actuality. It's chairs and tables, our own bodies, everything is possibility until we have looked and chosen and manifested. But where is this choice? Where is this choice? In which consciousness? When first this idea came about in the 1970s, some people took it very empowering way. In fact, not very far from here, there is a place in uh, Scotland called Findhorn. Some of you have gone there. It's a great place. I'm not, I'm, I have never been there. but. Uh, but I have very high respect for the place. But regardless of that, what I want to tell you is that they were so convinced for a while that we can manifest anything but just, just, just by wishing it. We intend and then we have the power to choose so we can manifest anything. And they used to give proof as the Findhorn, Findhorn Gardens. It's a deserty place, I'm told, and they quite could grow fantastic vegetables and fruits and beautiful things there. And then people became very ambitious and they started to visualize buildings and money and that's when it started to demoralize them because they couldn't. They couldn't produce those things just by imagining them. In America, there was a movement for a while um, and people did the same thing. Um, let's try to manifest a motor car. Cadillacs were very popular in America in those <laughs> days. So people would, there was, a, there was a song, a prayer, Oh God, give me a Cadillac. This was part of a Buddhist sect called Nichiren Buddhism. I don't know if you have heard of it. They literally um, meditated, Oh God, give me a Cadillac, Oh God, give me a Cadillac. And they would go on and on meditating like that, but it never happened. So, um, the wisdom developed that maybe that's a little bit too ambitious. So, let's try to manifest parking spaces for our car <laughs> in downtown busy areas. That worked a little bit better, but not much better. But it took up almost five, six, seven years to eradicate this kind of movement. But even then, there was a book out, a movie out, uh, subsequently called The Secret, that became very, very popular worldwide. I don't know how popular it was in England, but in America, it was very popular. Millions of people saw it. <clears throat> this was, I think, subsequent to What the Bleep. Um, and, um, you know, What the Bleep was popular, so um, The Secret probably was even more popular. And the message of the secret was that all you have to do is to sit and wish. And you will get what you wish. You don't have to do anything. Part of the message is even true. But not all of it. You cannot manifest with your ego consciousness, the ordinary consciousness that we experience. We just cannot do it. So downward causation is not at that level. Let's prove this with, with, a, with facing another paradox. Let's see if I have, I may not have that, um, no, I don't have that slide. So, <clears throat> what I'll do instead, I will tell you, how are we, how are we doing? Now, let's omit the paradox because um, our time is getting short. So, forgive me, uh, but let me state uh, the, um, the uh, reason of why that particular idea doesn't work very quickly. Suppose both of us, we are good friends, but both of us this particular day felt that we should have this particular Cadillac or BMW, whatever is your fancy car, and we want the same one to manifest. To get like an actual case which is more actual than this, uh, we go to a traffic light. And we are both very 
busy. We feel that we have the right to get green, so we want green light both. But I'm approaching the traffic light from this direction, you are from this direction. So who gets the green? If both could get the green, pandemonium, right? Nobody wants that. So I have to say that, look, <clears throat> I am the head honcho of my world. You are just a figment of my imagination. <laughs> like didn't Bishop Berkeley say a long time ago that until I see you, you are not real. Until I hear the sound of a tree, the tree never fell, right? So what do you say to that? This is called solipsism. There are a lot of people who are solipsistic. I have heard this story. A woman in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard meets a friend which, whom she hasn't seen for quite a while. Let's go to the coffee house and catch up with each other, she says. Goes to the coffee house. They sit together drinking coffee and she starts talking and talking and talking and talking. Half an hour later she becomes aware that she is talking all this time. So she says, oh, I'm talking about myself all this time. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? <laughs> now, we live, we live in such world. Many of us have that tendency of being a little, what philosophers call solipsistic, solipsism. But then the truth is that your friend would probably say that, no, you are the figment of my imagination. You are the tree and I am the observer. And without me, you don't exist. So this kind of argument boils down to who is the head honcho kind of argument and who can say, who really can say. We live in a democratic society. We don't like this kind of hierarchy. Paradox remains. How to solve the paradox? Again, to solve the paradox, we have to invoke the same kind of idea that we went into while considering this picture. Maybe both of us belong to something that is bigger than the both of us. Our consciousness, the little consciousness, the ego, belongs to a bigger, all-encompassing consciousness. You and I are not separate underneath, in a deeper level. We are like islands maybe on the bedrock of the ocean. At that bedrock we are one. So suppose, suppose this is the right view. The eye that sees the light is not the individual I, but the I of a greater consciousness. Let's call this quantum consciousness. This is what maybe ancient people was used to call God. This is where downward causation come from. This is where the causal power beyond matter exists. So yes, we do choose, but we choose provided we take the labor of understanding and getting there to this level of consciousness. It's subtle. We have to get to the deep level of consciousness. Then, then we can truly access where our choice is, where free will is, where creativity is, where love is, all these things that we covet is plentifully available to us except we have to access our deep level of consciousness. Then the question becomes of how to access. Right? So this is the basic integration. This is the basic integration. Now, I said that this is, uh, this is the theory part of it, but unless we can verify this experimentally, I mean, the credibility is limited. Science has two prongs. One is good theory, that makes sense. This theory makes sense because it resolves paradox instead of making paradox. 
Scientific materialism doesn't make sense because it makes paradox instead of resolving paradoxes. Dualism doesn't make sense because it's paradoxical from the get-go. So theoretically this is very sound. This is solid metaphysics. But still it's just metaphysics. And we can deny its validity just by saying that oh, still metaphysics, it's still philosophy. Show me something practical. Like this student went to the clergy and said, show me God. So can you show, even if this is a new definition of God, quantum consciousness, can you show, can you prove that there is signalless communication? Can you prove that there is a deeper level of consciousness of which all of us are just part, but we have access? Can you show this? And the answer is that if we can demonstrate that there is communication without signals, then we have proven the existence of God. Experimental question. All we have to prove is that the signalless communication is possible, is indeed demonstrable. <coughs> Scientific talk without mentioning Einstein is virtually impossible because he was so much of a genius. So this idea, experimental idea, actually came from a non-believer in quantum physics, Einstein himself, with two collaborators, Boris Podolsky and Nathan Rosen. Einstein in 1935, quantum physics was discovered in 1925-26, and this is just 10 years later. Einstein was anti-quantum physics, so his argument was this, why he became so anti. Two objects interact, and uh, if they interact, then they become correlated. This is the word that physicists used at that time. Nowadays, physicists also use the word entanglement. So they become entangled or correlated. Correlated means what? Correlated means even when they're not interacting, even, they when, uh, even when they move at a distance from each other, even then, they maintain the communication, even though they are at a distance. And this communication does not require any signal. No energy is exchanged, no dualism. They have just somehow, they have, they have retained a oneness with each other. They are part of the same system, somehow. So Einstein couldn't believe that there exists such thing as signal-less communication because he was a propounder of a theory called theory of relativity, very famous even now, very valid. And it says that in space and time, if two objects have to interact, they have to have a signal. They have to have a signal. The same argument that we gave against dualism. They have to have a signal. So Einstein didn't believe in quantum physics because it's weird. It gives a prediction that signalless communication is possible. Einstein also proved that there is a limit to the velocity of signals. This is the speed of light. So the idea grew, and it took many, many years to verify the idea, that if we can prove faster than light propagation of information from one object to another, if you can prove that there was no signal between two objects, conclusively, then we have proven this idea of signalless communication. This comes up again and again, so we give it a name. We call it non-locality. Signals are called local signals because they propagate a little bit at a time through space. And non-local then means that it is without any intermediary, the objects communicating instantly. This is the idea. So are they communicating? The demonstration was given for elementary objects, elementary particles, in the year 1982 by Alain Aspe in France who showed that indeed two particles of light, two objects of light called photons, they can communicate even when they are at a distance of some laboratory distance of eight meters or so apart. And that's enough 
And then some people uh, later on demonstrated that even when they are miles apart, they can, they can communicate. So there is no doubt that in some microscopic world at least, even a graduate student today can do this experiment, repeat the experiment, showing that yes, there is no local communication. Did not convince the scientific community. Majority of them held that, well, okay, we can accept that quantum objects are a little bit weird. But they belong to the submicroscopic world mostly. I mean, okay, so chairs and tables are quantum in a certain sense, but you are never going to, going to find non-locality there. And in some sense, that is true. We cannot do experiments like we did a spray type experiment with chairs and tables. So they just don't move that fast in possibility. Moves a little bit, but that's not enough to demonstrate non-locality. So how to demonstrate non-locality in the macro world? This became the challenge. <coughs> Brains, for example. A neurophysiologist at the University of Mexico and his collaborators they rose to the occasion and said, we'll show, we'll prove it. I got a call in, I still remember, and my, my, my body starts shaking a little. Uh, my hairs tend to turn, stand up when I think of that telephone call. I got a telephone call from this fellow named Greenberg Hakobo, Hako, his friends call him. Hako Greenberg um, called me and said that we have some data you might be interested because I wrote a paper with these ideas in 1989. This call came within uh, four years of that. So he says, it, it, we, we have some data and I think we need you to interpret this data because it, it's, it, it's showing something that you will be interested in. So I flew to the um, University of Mexico and, and, and looked at his data, looked at his apparatus and they did an experiment even in my presence. And indeed, the experiments proved what I thought. From what he said to me, it proves. Signal-less communication between brains. And when I show you the data, I hope you will be convinced too. It's a, it's a huge proposition to do it between, between people, right? And two people, suppose we could correlate them in some way. One moves this way and one another moves that way. One touches a cactus and says, ouch, that's understandable. But the other person saying, ouch, for nothing, that's weird. That's really weird. It's not like a, just like a photon that I could ignore. It's very far from my reality and your reality too. But look, uh, this, is, uh, this will blow your mind. So I hope the following actual experiment also does. So what did they do? They, their protocol was very simple. Two people meditate together with the intention. Now this part is very similar like the secret. So they just intend, but not for a Cadillac, they're intending so that they can directly communicate. They can directly, without signals. They can communicate without signals. Okay? After that, they have intended like that for 20 minutes. They are told to go on intending, but now they are separated. And the experimenters, of course, want to isolate them so that they cannot receive any signal from each other. They put them in what is called Faraday cages, electromagnetically impervious chambers. Got the picture? So they, they, there's no signal connection between them anymore only a meditative connection, non-local connection. If you cannot picture non-locality, think of it as a communication outside of space and time, not through space and time, no signals. Signals only take place in space-time communication. Outside of space and time, all is connected to consciousness. This is what they are, they are wanting to prove. So what they found is it's simply astounding hair raising. They connected each of the brain to individual electroencephalogram machines. This is crucial. And then they show a series of light flashes to only one of the subject. This subject's brain becomes full of electrical activity in the occipital area, of course. 
and that is picked up by the EEG machine. There is a lot of brain waves there and then they extract a signal from the brain waves by eliminating the noise with the help of the computer. This much is quite simple. So we have, we have this evoke potential. <coughs> now, in the, when they compared the brainwave data from the other subject's brain, which never sees, who never sees the light flashes, right? They take the brain waves anyway, eliminate the noise and get the signal. And then they compare the two signals here, the evoked and the other one. The other one is so close to the evoked that they felt compelled to call it a transferred potential. What else to call it? It's virtually the same, 71% overlap. Same in both strength and phase, which is the most amazing thing. Conclusion, especially when you look at control subjects, look, there is no transferred potential. We have reversed the colors, but this is the transferred one, the second subject who has not seen light flashes. Evoked potential is still there, but no transferred potential. This is when you wedge out, this is what happens to the brain. There is no discernible potential. It's an evoked potential. They purposely gave you light flashes because light flashes is a specific signature. So you cannot say that there is some, it's only a coincidence, happenstance. No, this is a specific signal of a specific signature. So this, this, this person, the second person, by virtue of intention, is really creating something in his or her brain. The secret is not entirely wrong. It is possible, but you have to have, you have to acknowledge some subtleties, otherwise it doesn't work, okay? You have to be connected together with non-local consciousness, which the intention and the situation, the selflessness of the situation did it for these two people, but does not do it when you want selfish desires to be satisfied like getting a Cadillac for myself. So if, if, you were, if you love to have a BMW, at least pray for somebody else's BMW, but maybe that would work. <clears throat> okay, but joking aside, this is a very, 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 very solid good news for those of us who love to see the integration, love to see the polarization gone from our society. And real good news because also because we now can get back to a world where there are values values like nonviolence that we need badly, values like um, love, beauty, truth, justice, goodness, ethics can come back in our businesses. And the outcomes are just, I cannot exhaust it this evening, I won't even try because I want to give you some time to ask me questions. So let me just say that it is revitalizing all of our sciences. There are many anomalous data in the meantime that uh, have piled up. Uh, theory of evolution itself is a good example. Darwin's theory was, was quite satisfactory for a while, but then uh, discrepancy in data uh, has shown up for some time, and we have not explained those data. There are many other anomalous data. Some of it is called paranormal, uh, mental telepathy and so forth that scientists have been ignoring for some 60 years, mm -hmm. very solid data. And then there is data about healing. People are spontaneously healed today and people can heal each other by prayer from a distance. Uh, it just, of course, homeopathy and acupuncture in healing, they're well-known uh, practices now and many of you have them. How do they work? There is no explanation within conventional science. This new science can explain each and one of every one of these anomalous phenomena. There are many paradoxes that biologists don't answer. Not only physics has its uh, paradox that I shared with you tonight, but biology has its own paradox, like it cannot even answer the elementary questions like what is life? New science can. 
Psychologists cannot distinguish between conscious and the unconscious, whereas the validity of the concept of unconscious is now verified since 1970. Nick Humphrey, who is actually a British, did that in 1970 with a, another fellow named Weisskranz. But psychology cannot explain both conscious and unconscious within the paradigms that they work with. The new science can. So I could go on and on. You can read my book, God is Not Dead, if you want some of the details. But there is some 25, 30 reasons, valid scientific reasons, data, that suggests that, yes, God is very much alive. Thank you. If you want to call God by quantum consciousness, you are welcome. But if you like the word God, you are welcome to go on using it and not be ashamed of it. It's solidly backed up. It is a scientific question. The answer is scientific, experimental, and theoretical, both. And it's all good news for God. The only question that remains, God exists. Scientific evidence for God is already here. So what are we going to do about it? Think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And hands are already coming up. Please. You mentioned uh, Finhorn Foundation and manifestation and said you hadn't been there. My question is, had you read any books by Eileen Caddy or Peter Caddy? founded with the co-founders of I, I met Pete Carey uh, once, very impressive person indeed. I have not read um, any of his books, but I read a book uh, by David Spangler, who was very popular at Findhorn for a while. So I was more pulling the leg of David Spangler and his experiments there. Uh, I don't know if Peter Caddy went along with all those excitement about manifestation. They manifested things, I can assure you. Um, <laughs> I, I've been up there quite a lot, and I was what they call a representative resource person. And I attended David Spangler's a workshop, became friendly with him on manifestation. Um, it was totally, the concept was totally new to me, but I realized I had been doing it many times in my life without realizing. Um, and I would agree with you that it probably can't be done from a level of ego consciousness, but I would say when they manifested things there, and it wasn't, as far as I know, it wasn't so much buildings in, well, one of the instances where they, they um, Eileen Caddy uh, felt she received guidance to order five bungalows, and they had Absolutely. no money for it. All kosher. And what manifested was the people who came at the right time and said, I want that, I'll pay for it. But what I was going to say was, I agree with you, it, it doesn't probably operate at the level of ego consciousness. Right. I've mani manifested many things myself, and probably it, 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 I've been in a different... As soon as you have brought people, you have solved the problem of manifestation. Because, of course, we can pray, and a mother-in-law gives us the present of a Cadillac. What's wrong with that? That happens many times in many people's lives. Right? Yes, sometimes it can be like yeah. coincidence. Yeah, but, of course. But when it happens many times and you actually would um, like it or desire it for your own spiritual path. Uh, if it starts, what we say now is this. It can we happen say, many, many times. We say that coincidences happen, synchronicity, as Carl Jung called it, all the time. The world is full of these synchronicities, and they are examples of this quantum non-locality. Carl Jung actually gave us quite a good picture of it. He never thought that psyche and matter are independent entities. They really felt that psyche is not really just psyche, it's psychoid. It's psyche and matter together. So our present model of the universe is that uh, quantum consciousness, God, holds these possibilities, both matter and psyche together. So if we think in terms of material level of manifestation, we made a mistake. Manifestation occurs in the psychological level, in the psyche, because that's what the quantum is. In the material level, at the macro level, 
really the quantum effects are extremely subdued. We cannot use that except to move maybe dice in Las Vegas a little bit and there are examples of people doing that. They are called psychokinetic, people with psychokinetic ability. But apart from that, there is very little evidence of this quantum creativity in uh, the material macroscopic domain. Where it is abundant is in the domain of the psyche. And that's where you look for manifestation, that's where you look for miracles, and you are absolutely so you right. Said it can happen. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Part of my <coughs> objective was to make fun of things. Right. Yes. Um, this last week, uh, all to do with uh, <coughs> free will. Um, and if, if there is such a thing as free will in philosophy, and that has been going through the last week, it's been on the radio, that they say that there's no such thing as free will, that we are programmed to do things. Um, well, this is a no, very, I mean, very you, relevant you question. <laughs> this. this is a very, very good question. I, I can give you a theoretical answer, which you already heard, that if we can connect to this deeper level of consciousness, then of course we have free will. We can choose and therefore we can choose freely and therefore we can choose, we can create, you know, but except that you have to go in the subtle domain. You pointed that out and it's beautiful. You have to involve people, you have to involve people with psyche. It does not happen at the gross material level much. Little bit, maybe once in a while, but not much. But experimentally, you know, uh, people are so one-sided in their approach. There is truth to what you've heard. In 1959, a, a way of measuring brain potential was discovered. This is called the readiness potential experiment people uh, showed that, um, you know, before, before this, let me go back a little, philosophers used to demonstrate free will in the classroom by saying that I'm free willing to raise my arm and then he raises the arm, right? Free will, out of my free will. So this neurophysiologist did a very wonderful thing. They wired up the brain with electrodes and then connected to a machine like electroencephalogram and um, then they discover something very interesting. Even before the fellow raises the arm, full 900 milliseconds before that, there is a reading in the EEG that tells the experimenter that the fellow is going to raise his arm. So behavior started asking, this presence of this steadiness potential is already making the raise in the arm very predictable event. So what kind of free will is that can be predicted, right? And they are absolutely right in thinking that. But that euphoria did not last more than 20 years. In 1985, 25 years, 1985, another neurophysiologist named Benjamin Libet rose to the occasion and he did a variation of this experiment. Readiness potential is still there, but Libet's subjects were told that why don't you do this? There's two components of this free willing situation. First you have the thought that I'll raise my arm, and then only you raise your arm. So after you have the thought, actively resist yourself. Don't raise your arm. It turns out that there is a 200 millisecond window between our thought and our action. That's the time it takes for the motor neurons to listen to the neocortex. So, Libet's subjects tried. Not all of them succeeded, but many of them. The neurophysiologist says from the readiness potential, hey, look, this fellow is going to raise the arm, but they didn't. They could resist themselves. They didn't. We have the power of saying no <coughs> to conditioning. And this is how we can demonstrate free will. Indeed, this is how people, at least temporarily, resist the temptation of smoking. Temporarily, we read that it's not so difficult because you can do it only for a time, you cannot do it forever. But temporarily, at least, we can demonstrate free will just by simply saying no to our condition. But yes, where please. does multitasking come into that? Where you're doing ten things at once? Yeah, fine. So? So women can do that. <laughs> so everything's overlapping? 
Yeah, but 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 what is free will got to do with it? So I am doing doing that because um, you know have that's the conditioning. Oh, conditioning. Okay. Thank you. I can be conditioned to do that more than you can. Right? Okay. Is that a good thing? I don't think it's a particularly good or bad thing. It's a very bad thing while you are driving. Multitasking while driving is a very bad idea because you don't always you don't always succeed. So don't do any dangerous activity while multitasking. I used to multitask myself, you know, cooking is fun for me and I found that cooking is boring. Um, so I used to, uh, while something is uh, trying to come from boiling to simmering, uh, it takes about five minutes before you can put uh, a lid on. So I used to try to cut vegetable or do something else. And I started seeing that more often than not the food burns. <laughs> so I stopped multitasking entirely and of course people who multitask while making love know how frustrated the partner becomes. <laughs> so don't do it in certain specific occasions. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I was just going to say that um, I'm a homeopath so I pay great attention to the scientific denialists who are in the press all the time. One of the things they like to say is that homeopathy is placebo, which is great. You know, that's on itself is another, you know, proof that <laughs> things can happen. It, it, it is, signal. it is, and I'm delighted that finally, finally we're acknowledging it a little bit. A lot of vets, a lot of homeopathic vets are saying, well, we use homeopathy on herds of cows and they don't even know they've had the remedy. So the latest thing they're saying, and these are the denialists, there is such a thing as placebo by Absolutely. proxy. There is such a thing as placebo which proves the effect of mind And then, on you know, everybody falls about laughing because this <coughs> is getting ridiculous then, you know. To back up the possibility. Is it? I mean, if the placebo is an amazing phenomenon. It's an example of mind-body healing, right? And it's great because it shows us the power of downward causation. So it's, it's, a, it's a question of what connects us to that source, quantum consciousness. If a certain belief in a certain way connects us to that quantum consciousness, impossible things can happen. It does not mean that I can walk on water, but it does mean that if the cause of my disease is in the mind, which often it is, then healing can occur. Many uh, of our ailments, this is the new finding, this astounding part of the new finding, Many of our ailments are not caused at the material level. If we acknowledge that there is such a thing as psyche, and psyche is not made of the brain, if we acknowledge that, we acknowledge that we are made up of a body of feelings, we are made up of a body of mind, we are made up of even more uh, sophisticated bodies than that. But body of feeling and body of mind, when you put that in, body of feeling is called vital body, vital energy body, body of prana in India or ki in China, those are, those have been well known in those two cultures, this body. In, in, even in the West, William Blake wrote a very famous poem in the 18th century which says, energy is eternal delight. But energy was not a word in physics until 1837, 19th century. So how did Blake know about energy? He's not talking about physical energy. He's talking about vital energy. And it is delight. If you get, get in touch with your vital energy of your prana, life becomes delightful. Vitality, full of energy that we can feel and feel great. So the point is that we sometimes block this vital energy, especially in our heart chakra, and um, the blockage is due to a mental belief that whatever, I'm limited, I cannot love without this person or loving is wrong, I shouldn't do it, indulge myself with such a thing as love because others are not getting it. Whatever reasons we have, we close up in our heart energy and that causes our disease. This is a serious disease like women's breast cancer, I think it's mostly because of grieving. For a variety of reasons. It's very sad. 
that heart energy get blocked, the immune system is affected, that's the organ on, with which heart energy is correlated. And when the immune system doesn't work, many kinds of disease can happen, not only just cancer. Cancer is an extreme case. But it is the immune system <coughs> weakness that even can give you a cold. You must have wondered, same cold, or cold virus is around during the cold season, some people get it, some people don't. If it, things were allopathic only, material causes, then everybody should get the cold virus. But some people don't. Why? Because of the immune system. They have a strong immune system that resists better than others who have weakened their immune system by blocking the heart energy. It's as simple as that. This is why cold vaccines don't seem to work very well. Because why? Because we cannot improve the immune system by, by vaccinating, vaccinating ourselves. So, cutting it short, Belief that I can be healed unblocks the heart energy, at least temporarily. Placebo healing usually is not permanent healing, but at least temporarily that unblocking will strengthen the immune system and therefore will heal the person. So this is now completely established that 60% of all the efficacy of pharmaceuticals, which cost hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars, actually are achieved by simply placebo effect. Because we are, if we are given a medicine, we live in such a scientifically worked culture that we believe better. The same thing could be done going to a hands-off healer, just uh, she or he just put simple pumps we can ourselves do it actually, if you, if you want to learn it, you can, it's very easy. And even that would unblock the heart energy equally if you believed in it. But because we don't, we believed in the pharmaceuticals, so we get a thousand uh, dollar hand massage and we heal ourselves. But that's still good because it shows that the scientific materialism is full of holes, it's wrong. Okay. Yes, please. Um, I spent a large part of my life um, being guided by what I call life consciousness. And what you just said, you know, I fully believe. Um, if we, we have to know that it's right, we have to believe in it completely. But then it works. And I was always guided to the right people, the right places. It was magic. And, um, you know, I, it's like what you said about the heart chakra. You just listen to your consciousness. Where shall I go next? Or uh, It's not what you necessarily uh, desire but what you need is provided what you what you need is provided by god mm -hmm. and i found that i was out in india or somewhere with nobody no bank accounts nothing but always it seemed to work oh this something happened that enabled me to carry on you know have food and everything so i do believe in that you can carry on on this subject eternity i love it <laughs> yeah, I mean, the point is that yes, 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 there is um, a lot of truth in the idea that God provides and therefore we really can solve bulk of our problems by having this basic faith. You see, what is the basic um, stuff that we need today to solve our problems? Everybody knows the answer, it's creativity and innovation. What keeps us away from creativity? It is the fear it is the fear that if I deviate from our ordinary path, chucked out path that society approves, we'll, we will not be supported, will not be secured. It is that fear that keeps us mostly from creative, taking creative risks. But really, do we need to be afraid? The new science is telling us that, look, it's all happening in the movement of consciousness. Everything is ultimately the movement of consciousness whenever people are involved. The movement of the possibilities, they are the movement that it could be called predictable and mechanical. Quantum mechanical, to be sure, but they are just possibilities. They are not becoming actualities. Actuality depends on consciousness. Therefore, whatever that manifests in the human affairs, they are all full of choice. We can choose. If we want to choose creativity, we can choose. 
So what will provide? It sounds a little bit outrageous at first. But then you enter creativity, creative life, you choose it, and you find literally what happens is that these things that we call synchronicities, coincidences, they start appearing. I was just talking to uh, an Englishman just a few days ago. He went to India and his, um, his bag was held up in um, uh, Bangkok or Singapore, one of those intermediate places, and it did not arrive. Now the poor fellow had all of his money in the bag. Now don't ask why he put the money not in his person <laughs> but on the, in the bag. It's a mistake, but he did it and he doesn't have any money. But the fellow was somehow a little bit enlightened about the new way of living that is coming about. And he said to himself that, okay, what have I got to lose? If I have to starve, I have to starve. But let me keep an optimistic attitude. And uh, he just moves a few paces and immediately health start arriving. He said, it's a, he said to me that it's an amazing thing. He was, he was praising the Indian people. Oh, India is such a nice place, so hospitable. But of course, I know the true story. I started laughing. <laughs> and, um, and he says, why are you laughing? I said, you know, I have the same experience in the Western countries, in England, in Holland, in America, in, in Russia, everywhere. Whenever I'm in distress, I have never had to keep in distress for very long. I had many times a tire punctures, I had many times when I've lost a ticket. Every time somebody or other will come and ask. Initially I thought it's my bewildered Indian face which is very distraught and people are coming to help. But that is not even true. People just come to help. Synchronicity. If we depend on providence, this is why it is so important to re-establish the authenticity of this concept of God and concept of downward causation. If we have faith, old-fashioned religious word, faith, then help arrives, help comes, nothing to worry. Why? Because this is a world that we have built. It's our consciousness. It's not separate from us. This is what the lesson of deep ecology that this college teaches. Schumacher College is famous for its ecological leanings. What is the uh, idea of deep ecology? That not only our ecosystem is important, but it's us. It's connected to us. We create our ecosystem and therefore we should take care of it. And this is this idea is constantly will be reinforced if you start believing like this gentleman does. Like I hope you will after tonight. Can I just say I'm sure that there are more questions to come and um I'm sitting down here and um, I'm getting this uh, non-local communication from our in the dining room to say that we're manifesting drinks and cakes. So um, I'd just like to um, ask you to join me to show some appreciation to Amit and please let's continue this conversation um, over drinks.